for coming to um, our data seminar today. Uh, today we have um, uh, maybe slightly unusual format for the data seminar. Um, the work leads for the computing sciences area super facility project are going to give a series of uh, lightning highlights of, of the work we've been doing in the last year, kind of highlights of uh, 2020. This is part of our uh, 2020 year in review um, um, a, a set of talks. The first one um, going over the science highlights was given at the NERSC uh, all to all uh, yesterday afternoon. And so what you're going to hear is a series of um, updates from each of the technical work leads in the projects talking about their work. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Super Facility Project, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of um, what we're doing. So Computing Sciences uh, supports many users and many projects from experimental and observational facilities, both within the Department of Energy and um, from external, um, uh, external experiments. And this is something we've been doing for a long time. Um, computing Sciences have a long and um, very uh, lustrous record of working with experimental science teams to help them um, get their data where it needs to be, help them analyze their data and help them to use uh, supercomputers. So this is something that we've um, been doing very well for years, but we're seeing that this is an increasing um, uh, need from the experimental science teams to be able to really handle large amounts of data and large quantity in computing. And the needs of this community um, is starting to really challenge us and challenge um, the computing capabilities of these uh, science teams. So the needs go simply beyond providing um, a nice network, some strong compute resources and a lot of storage. Um, they have rather complex needs um, that we've seen over the years through various requirements reviews. And the super facility concept um, within the computing sciences um, aims to address these needs. So we want to um, link up uh, experimental, um, uh, experimental detectors to high performance networking and high performance computing and also um, give them the tools and capabilities and expertise they need to do um, the full workflow end to end. So this involves, yes, um, high performance networking, compute and storage. Um, but also the ability to move and manage data between sites um, the ability to have uh, real time or short turnarounds uh, and interactive access for their computing. They need to have uh, resilient workflows that run across multiple locations and a whole ecosystem of edge services that persist um, over long periods of time, you know, months, maybe even years, including um, workflow managers, visualization tools, databases, web services uh, and a lot more. And uh, this is something that Kathy Yellick uh, recognized many years ago um, and has been part of the CS area strategic plan um, uh, for the last five years. And um, around about a year ago, we uh, instituted the super facility project. Now, this is a project with a small p in inverted commas because it's not a DOE project. This is an internal project uh, to computing sciences. And it was designed to coordinate all the work that's being done across computing sciences um, where it makes sense to coordinate and track um, all the work we're doing to support experimental science. Because one thing that we've noticed um, uh, very much is that a lot of different uh, science areas and a lot of different experiment teams are facing the similar kind of challenges. And for us to be able to scale up our support of uh, all these science teams, we need to take a coordinated approach so that the um, solutions, the tools and technologies we're developing so that they are, um, are going to be applicable across multiple science communities. So the goal of this project um, is always designed to be a three year project, not because uh, the science will go away in three years, but because we wanted to have a, a defined end goal and a concerted um, push and effort to develop um, the, the technologies we need uh, for a sustainable um, support of this workload. So the goal is that by the end of 2021, so by the end of this year, more or less, um, we will have at least three of our science application engagements able to demonstrate automated pipelines that analyze data at scale um, without routine human intervention. So automation is a really key part of this. We've identified specific capabilities that we want to be able to support, um, including real time computing, high performance networking, um, data movements and management. Um, automation driven by uh, API um, using uh, Jupyter uh, as one of our compute methods 
And then also um, starting to use federated identity for authentication methods and um, you, this is hosting this um, whole ecosystem of edge services um, with our spin service. Um, and I have here on the right of this slide um, eight uh, science engagements that we're particularly working with. Um, this is a selection of science teams who have been chosen because their needs um, represent a whole spectrum um, of from different scales. Um, they each have slightly different needs of uh, computing and workflow and storage and networking. And so by working closely with these teams and by gathering requirements from all these teams, we're able to uh, design tools and technologies that will meet the needs of a large part of our user base. And that's something that's very important. OK, um, so we've now been running for two years. And really, this last year has been uh, really very impressive uh, on part of the Super Facility team. The Super Facility project has achieved a lot this year under difficult circumstances. Um, they've done a lot of work to gather requirements uh, designing and launching new tools and capabilities for our users. And that's what we want to talk to about uh, today. We want to kind of show off uh, this work we've been doing and give updates on uh, where we are with a lot of these tools and technologies. So the format, as I said, each technical work lead in the project will present their highlights um, for 2020. Um, and we'll be doing this by a work area. The project has four uh, work areas in our org charts, um, applications, gathering requirements and deployment of applications for the users, uh, the scheduling and middleware um, work area, an area uh, really focusing on automation, um, automated systems and automation in the network, and then a work area around data management. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to start um, going through our, our, our updates. One thing I will ask, I'll ask that we um, everyone hold questions till the end. Um, we have a lot uh, of highlights to get through and I want to make sure everyone has a chance to present um, and then we can go uh, go through questions at the end. All right, so first up, um, we have uh, Laurie talking about our NISAP for Data work. Hi everyone, so if you're familiar with NISAP, it's a program where we work with science teams to try to optimize their applications for our system. So one uh, part of that is NISAP for Data, who's been focusing on a lot of the projects Debbie just described. Uh, we have a lot of postdocs who are kind of wrapping up and also a new class that are coming in. Uh, so just to give you a quick overview, we had uh, Yun Sung who was uh, working with Atlas and CMS. He's, he's now off to NVIDIA. Uh, kind of our middle class of postdocs, we have Oshin and Daniel who are working with LZ and Desi, respectively. Um, and we have upcoming uh, Felix, who's not pictured, um, who'll be working with XFL. We have Nestor, Nick, and Lippy, who will be working with uh, Toast, the CMB experiment, uh, JGI Resilient Workflows, and Lippy Gupta. So uh, she'll be working with the ALS. So we're looking forward to all the contributions that the NISAP for Data program can make in the super facility space. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, next, um, with Kelly updating us on outreach. Thanks. Um, so outreach this past year has taken sort of a two pronged approach. Um, the first uh, slide here describes one of the prongs that is sort of um, the large outreach to the larger community <clears throat> in the HPC and um, user space. So last year, uh, Bjorn Enders gave um, a great talk on best practices for running at NERSC as a kickoff meeting to our NERSC user group special interest group for experimental facility um, users. Following that introductory talk, the community um, hosted a series of talks from one from each experimental facility sharing opportunities and challenges that they've faced at NERSC um, and, and really came together to, to learn from each other. Um, Following that from NERSC, there was a demonstration series of super facility tools presented virtually um, where a number of the technologies that will be discussed later on in this presentation were demonstrated to the, um, the community. And then finally, we had a number of great talks and workshops at the 2020 supercomputing conference, including the um, presentation at the XLOOP workshop and a state of the practice talk. Um, on the next slide uh, is 
a description of the other outreach prong that um, we've been working on this past year, which is outreach to the science partners. How can NERSC help the science partners make better use of the super facility tools? What existing documentation do they already have? How can we um, help them help their users or help their staff use NERSC more effectively? And out of this, um, we, we've collected uh, existing doc their existing documentation and done a comprehensive review of that. And as a follow-up, um, we're doing targeted meetings with interested uh, research group areas at experimental facilities like the ALS, the Advanced Light Source. Thanks. Great, thanks Kelly. Uh, so next, Bill's gonna tell us about work in the area of policies. So super facility policies, the goal of this sub area is to see that uh, user incentives and user decision making process sort of encourages the good outcomes that we're looking for. We want to we want to try and guide people in the right area. Uh, at the beginning of the year, the state of this area was uh, I had just accepted the role as the lead of the policies. Uh, Currently, uh, we are sitting on a, we have designed a consensus vetted uh, setup for what I want to call campaign users. And the goal of this is an implementation of an idea that has been floating around for a few net years now called data users, which would be ways to bring in sort of additional user facility associated researchers into NERSC in sort of a streamlined fashion. Uh, it has been a strategic talking point for a number of years. How does NERSC grow from being uh, an institution with thousands of users to being tens of thousands or more users? And uh, these campaign users are one of the ways that I'd like to see that uh, made real. Uh, the goal would be to leverage some of the other super facility work such as federated ID and shared user accounts that would belong more to a research project at a partner user facility and not individual humans. And we can make use of lots of the existing infrastructure that manages quotas, that manages identity, access management, uh, automation and APIs uh, to end up with a system that can be easily connected to existing user onboarding systems at other user facilities. Uh, I yield my time. Great, thanks, Bill. All right, uh, next we're going to hear about uh, Jupiter and some of the work being done. So, yeah. Okay, uh, so yeah, this is uh, Roland. I'm going to talk about Jupiter briefly. Uh, in the Super Facility Project, we think that the Jupiter Notebook is a rich user interface that has really great potential to make interacting with supercomputers easier and more productive help attract new kinds of users uh, and explain, expand the application of supercomputing to new science domains, especially experimental and observational science facilities like those that are the focus of the super facility initiative. Um, of course, this takes work. Uh, Jupiter didn't come, uh, come out of Berkeley to be uh, necessarily directly installed onto supercomputers and just ready to go, uh, but it takes work from people like us in super facility to make this work. Um, and other people at NERSC who've, who've helped to make uh, this possible. So this past year, we've been able to support about 2,000 unique users uh, using Jupyter on Cori. So that means about 25% of all interaction with Cori goes through Jupyter now. Um, many of the users that are using Jupyter are from the EOD space, uh, LSST, DESI, LCLS. These are projects that are all using Jupyter. Um, in the past year, we've um, we've uh, been able to um, change, uh, make changes in the stability of the system, basically through changing deployment, moving to Rancher 2 in, in SPIN, and uh, leveraging CI-CD uh, practices for, for supporting the service. Um, we've also in, introduced a number of extensions that are useful at NERSC, but also at other HPC centers, like interacting with Slurm through Jupyter Lab. Um, that's a picture on the right of that. And we've also continued our robust community engagement, uh, working with other HPC centers and other facilities uh, to adapt Jupiter to HPC um, and large scale science uh, facilities. So um, 
Shreyas is going to take the next slide. Yeah, so I'll um, dive into some of the actual work we've done with um, our science engagement. So this is um, some work we've done with the ALS, particularly with the uh, Dula Parkinson's beamline. Um, and we're working to basically help, uh, help them run Jupiter to do these um, parameter sweeps where they can use a tool called paper mill that lets you take a set of parameters and then run it across a bunch of notebooks or run each parameter set across a bunch of notebooks to figure out what the right parameter set you want to use uh, needs to be. And then you can kind of mint the sort of, here's my master parameter set and then I can run that against the rest of my data set. So this has been really useful for them to be able to figure out um, how to you know, hone in on, on some of their, their parameters for the tomography workflows. Um, and then we're also doing things like building various tools in the ecosystem for them. So there's the slice viewer that lets them you know, dig through a set of uh, 3D images and, and kind of flip through a bunch of those with, with different parameters. Um, and so what we're, and this is part of the work that we're doing with, between the super facility and NERSC and CRD. Um, and so this has been really useful and really helpful. And we presented this work at um, X Loop at Supercomputing this year as well. Okay, right, next slide. Thanks. Okay, so next up, uh, Bjorn is going to tell us about workflow planning for NERSC 9. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, so this is a new area. Uh, basically, we, we want to make make sure that NERSC 9 is ready for automated workflows and can be easily integrated uh, in our partner facility pipelines. And to this end, um, you know, we collect requirement for super facility partners. We make sure we have like adequate milestones in the integration, in the user integration area. We also took some steps um, to reach out to workflow to developers and you know made a bit of noise the workflow related events, uh, in contact with ExaWorks or taking part in the workflows at community summit. Uh, but really, this is a, a work in progress. So um, if you have uh, an automated workflow that you want to make sure it runs on it and there's nine or uh, uh, yeah, any kind of workflow you want to be considered, you know, please feel free uh, to reach out uh, so we can make sure that uh, your requirements are reflected in our planning. Thank you. Thanks, Bjorn. So next, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about workflow resiliency, um, building on from that. So in 2020, uh, we started really actively working on um, enabling our science partners to run reliably uh, across multiple facilities. And I emphasize we've started working on this. This is uh, also a work in progress, but uh, one that I'm, I'm quite excited about. So there are three main areas that we've been focusing on. Um, one is that we have an ALCC um, award um, of time at, um, at all the, the OSCAR compute facilities. So at ALCF and OLCF, as well as at NERSC, this is work that Katie and Tifus has been leading. Um, and this is a group that's exploring container technologies and data management tools uh, and see how the technologies can run across the different um, facilities. Um, we also have an LDRD award within Berkeley Lab um, to develop resilient workflows for 24-7 science. And this is uh, working initially with um, physics experiments um, and we're starting to look at how, from a user perspective, um, how easy or how hard it is to take their workflow to, to different uh, compute resources. We've already learned um, some very useful pain points and that gives us good um, pointers to where um, we might wanna be uh, focusing future efforts and future work in trying to run uh, workflows across facilities. We also have a nice uh, demonstration this year uh, the Jupyter notebooks are actually one way that you could consider having um, a, a workflow that could run at multiple locations. We've been able to demonstrate that with uh, notebooks running at NERSC and also running at Slack at the LCLS experiment. So again, this is uh, very much active work in the next year as well. All right, um, now we're moving into um, the work area of um, middleware and scheduling. And the first uh, work area to talk about here is Federated ID, where Mark's going to tell us about work being done there. So uh, a year ago, um, we had developed a, a proposed architecture, and we had some isolated proof of concept, proof of concept implementations, um, really just to kind of kick the tires and make sure that we were familiar enough with some of the components. And there was a, a strong likelihood that they would be 
uh, useful for, for our application. And uh, a year later, our status is we've, we've really been working on two prongs. One of them is kind of a policy area. And so we've developed a set of federated ID policies. And these technologies are, are mature and have, are heavily used in uh, academic research in higher ed, but it was treading new ground for NERSC. And so we really had to be thoughtful about how we were implementing uh, external authentication and think very carefully about which external uh, institutions we were willing to trust. And so we created a set of proposals and we work closely with our security team to refine those and adjust our, our risk tolerance appropriately for NERSC. And then uh, we went through a fairly uh, comprehensive security review of those policies and have made adjustments based on recommendations we've received. We've also uh, now implemented all of the major technical components of the stack, and these are a, a tool set from Internet2, as well as the um, Identity Python group or uh, project. And these include uh, identity registries, uh, authorization, as well as tools that allow uh, the users to select their home institution and place a filter on them so that they only can select institutions that we're willing to federate with. And you can see an example of that in the upper right hand corner of the slide. The interface remembers which institutions you've used in the past and it lets you search for new institutions and those institutions will be filtered in the manner I described. You'll only find them if it's something that we're willing to trust. Uh, we've also completed a security review of these technical components and we've briefed DOE headquarters and, uh, and gained approval to proceed with our pilot project. Uh, pretty much all of the features are ready except for the, the final uh, multi-factor step up. So we want to make sure that if the home institution doesn't implement multi-factor authentication, that we have an opportunity to require it of the user. And so the code for that is being finalized and we expect to have uh, everything put together uh, so that we'll be ready for a uh, pilot implementation in March. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so next, Gabor is going to tell us about the API into NERSC. Uh, yes. Hi, it's Gabor, and I work on the API. And uh, the idea of the API is that anything that you can do by logging into the machines, you should be able to do from a script uh, via the API. So a year ago, uh, the API, most of the API calls just returned fake information. So it was sort of a proof of concept that didn't do anything. The authentication was a homegrown authentication that uh, we wrote ourselves. Uh, versus today, we have a standards-based authentication that uses the Connect to ID server that uses the um, OIDC uh, standard for authentication. Uh, many of the APIs are now functional, so you can check on system health or center health, rather. Uh, you can run jobs, retrieve, retrieve their results, and you can move data around using the storage APIs. Um, we had a security review of the API and, and the authentication around it. Uh, the, change, the changes that were recommended that came out of that review were implemented. We also had a UX review that sort of looked at how to use the API and how to make it friendlier for users. So we have implemented a lot of those uh, suggestions as well. We've started uh, to reach out to other, other centers uh, and facilities that have similar APIs like CSCS and TAC. And we're hoping that in the future, there'll be collaboration between the centers and, and maybe um, have a, a set of APIs that are sort of common to all the centers. Um, next up will be a, a soft launch where, where, soft launch where we uh, select certain uh, users and partners that will enable and they will be doing uh, more testing and using the API. The API is up at api.nurse.gov if you want to check it out. And documentation is in progress. It's viewable inside NERSC and we're hoping to integrate it into the customer facing documentation soon. Great, thanks Gabor. Uh, next, Corey's gonna tell us about SPIN. Hi, uh, so SPIN is our uh, container platform at NERSC where users can develop um, services and uh, websites and science gateways to uh, complement their scientific projects. Um, about a year ago, uh, we actually launched in um, 
May of 2018 and had a long pilot phase. Uh, about a year ago, we're still concluding that pilot phase and we're just on the brink of introducing a, a major new um, version of the system that's been runs on. We had about 135 users at that, at that stage. Uh, so now a year later, we're in the full production um, with, and we're on a new uh, instance of the uh, underlying system is Rancher 2. This is essentially a complete redeployment. Um, uh, and this system is based on Kubernetes. So it has a lot of new modern features. It's very robust. It introduces a new web user interface that's easier for users to, to get started. And this also dovetailed uh, nicely with uh, CARES Act funded um, large memory nodes. So we built our production cluster this summer for the Rancher 2 in instance um, based on a large memory node so we can support a wider variety of, of workloads uh, in this new Rancher 2 instance in, in SPIN. Uh, meanwhile, we kept the uh, support and training uh, going and, and add some new features there. So we did five workshops over the last year. Uh, we added an office hours every other Friday uh, the workshop materials and the documentation were redone, and we've added some support from other groups at NERSC as the popularity of the service has continued to grow. So uh, APG and DAS and DSEG and UEG all have um, folks that are helping out in the support and training, and we're uh, up to over 200 users now as of the last workshop here just in February, and uh, over 40 NERSC projects that have uh, expressed interest or already started working in SPIN for, for their work. And a few, of the, um, a few of the highlights are shown there um, to the right. Thanks, Corey. So now we're moving into um, technical work areas in the automation uh, work area within the uh, project. And uh, Taylor's gonna kick us off there talking about self-managed systems. Sure. So as these systems get uh, larger and we have more complex workflows, one of the efforts that we realize we need is to, to make these uh, more automated and, and easier to operate. So this is a monthly meeting group um, where we discuss best practices and what is going around um, or what's going on in the whole CS area. Uh, a lot of topics include things like monitoring and uh, tuning system power. We have conversations with HPE, presenting uh, their work with NREL, um, we have collaborations with ALCF we've presented, um, and presentations on Splunk capabilities via ESnet. So it's uh, you know, a really good set of discussions. And um, the, the, I think the most exciting thing is that, you know, I think this will springboard uh, how we do things on, on Perlmutter. So we're really excited to, to get to work on that. Uh, so next, Ashwin's going to tell us about work being done around software-defined networking. Hello, everyone. Uh, network resource reservation and advanced networking capabilities are covered in the SDN technology area. Uh, as of uh, Jan 2020, uh, NERSC, uh, ESnet, and Slack have deployed a dynamic multipoint OSCAR circuit infrastructure. Uh, projects like uh, XFL at Slack can automatically initiate an OSCAR circuit to NERSC and uh, tied it down after the data transfer is completed. Um, uh, we have extended our data center to provide uh, an aggregate 400 gigabits bandwidth to the NSIM user facility at the Molecular Foundry. Uh, and last year, uh, we've deployed a Slurm plugin to allocate uh, bandwidth balanced compute nodes in Cori. Uh, we've started a major project uh, to overhaul NERSC core networks. Uh, this will provide more bandwidth and programmable resource reservation capabilities for super facility scientific workflows. Um, as part of the effort, uh, we have started deployment of 400 gigabit ethernet at NERSC. Uh, we also have a group effort underway with Slack and ESnet to iron out the last mile data transfer issues. We are working on building unified data dashboards for end-to-end -end monitoring and tuning. Lastly, uh, we have projects underway this year to incrementally upgrade our bandwidth to ESnet by 5x. Thank Great, thanks Ashwin. Okay, uh, next Tom's gonna tell us about work being done in the Sense projects. 
Yes, hello. I'm talking about the ne next generation work we're doing in the network infrastructure. So this is uh, focused on multi-domain orchestration and automation for network services. It, it expands on some of the Oscar services that we heard about just now. And the, um, the objective there is that the through the SNET uh, developed sense project, there's an ability to do orchestration of multi-domain network services where the network services include not only the networking infrastructure, but also the networking stack inside of in systems like DTNs. So we made a lot of progress in trying to understand how that type of multi-domain automated orchestrated service could be utilized in the context of a super facility and distributed infrastructure. So one of the prototype um, re research projects that we've worked on this year is with um, the XFL and the LCLS in terms of moving data from Slack to NERSC and uh, integrating that with workflows. So kind of the, there's two main focuses for this effort. One is that the distributed infrastructure itself and the other is the integration with the application workflow. So we've done some initial work there and we're making more progress and it's a little bit broader than, you know, just uh, one type of workflow or one type of infrastructure. So if we'll go to the next slide, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, actually, I think, um, Maybe the next slide might be one more forward than that, Debbie. Ah, things have been moved, sorry. There we are. Uh, actually, one more. Yeah, that's, that's the one, exactly. OK, great. Yeah, so just in terms of the idea of distributed uh, network infrastructure and orchestration, we are very focused on how domain science workflows can integrate with this. And you know, now that we have kind of an API-driven multi-domain network services capability, and now we heard also about the super facility, NERSC super facility API, you know, there now there's an API going to be available into the computational resources. So a lot of the work we're trying to do is figure out how can domain science workflows utilize these different APIs and how can these APIs work together to enhance workflows. So we're looking at multiple workflows, but one of the one communities that we've been working closely with is the LAC community and they have various systems like Rusio and FTS and things above that that are trying to develop the intelligence of how to use these. So that's a, a large focus for this effort is to uh, integrate these types of capabilities with the domain, domain science workflows. Great, thanks Tom. Uh, so next we're moving now into the uh, data management uh, work area of the project, um, but on the continuing the theme of data movement, uh, Lisa's gonna tell us about work being done, I mean da data movement in this work area. Hi, so we've had a, a pretty productive year in 2020 in terms of the data movement space. Um, been moving data across all the centers quite a bit. Um, and starting in 2020, um, we only sort of had the standard Globus endpoints available where users could write as themselves to and from our various file, file systems. We had a very early prototype of uh, GPFS, HPSS interface uh, deployed, which is called GI. It's a new way of interfacing with HPSS. Um, so as of now, at the end of 2020, um, we've deployed a new service in Globus that lets, um, that lets groups that use collaboration users um, read and write via Globus as the collaboration user on the file system. Um, so it's very useful for the super facility partners. They make a, a pretty extensive use of um, collaboration users. And so having this is um, much more convenient. They no longer have to transfer data in and then open tickets to ask um, the nurse staff to do chones and, and permission changes. Um, so in 2020, we had about one and a half petabytes of data moved um, using these endpoints. Um, and in total, we moved about a little under 40 petabytes in 2020 for all of our, all of our data throughout NERSC um, with these tools. Um, and so the early testing of GHI is done, the GPFS and HPSS interface. Um, and then during 2020, um, we were to dramatically improve the usability and security of the interface. Um, and we've done successful testing with several super facility groups and other teams. Um, and there's some set of published documents uh, on how to use the system and you can go and check it out yourself if you wanna kick the tires. Uh, we've also scheduled, um, worked with Slurm to develop uh, uh, some a capability to have uh, batch system data movement so that you can um, migrate data automatically from CFS uh, to or HPSS to um, Nurse 9 Scratch before your job starts. Um, have that be integrated into the batch system so that it will it will hold your job until the data is ready. Um, and the target for that is uh, fall of 2021 in Perlmutter. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so next. Uh, Mariam will tell us about work being done in networking tools. 
Okay, so hi everyone. Um, so this year we were focused more on network analytics tools. Um, so there are two main tools which we are currently working on uh, highlighting today. So the NetPredict tool, which was launched last year, it's mostly kind of like a machine, real-time machine learning Google Maps style uh, to predict what the network traffic is gonna look like on ESNet in the future so that we can plan our big data transfers accordingly. So what we've done is we've uh, updated that tool with a graph neural network behind the scenes, which has uh, improved the predictions of the network traffic and we've published a paper on this. Uh, initially, the tool was deployed on Google Cloud Platform, but now we're working with the SPIN team to move that tool onto SPIN so that we can have much more control over what is going on behind the scenes. Uh, the second tool is a new tool, uh, the Net Preflight tool, uh, which we've been developing specifically for the Super Facility team. Uh, so this is in collaboration with Bjorn and uh, Bashir, my postdoc. So Bjorn identified this problem where when we do a DTN to DTN transfer, there is no way in knowing what the network performance is before you do the transfer. And the tools like iPerf and Persona usually require a client to be running on the other end to actually get the correct uh, uh, information. So what we've done is we've developed this tool where you don't need any client to be deployed, but you can use socket programming and a bunch of file transfers to actually calculate what the current bandwidth and the trace route is before you do the transfer. So our current tests have shown comparable results to IPER, and we are writing this up into a paper, and we will be presenting this tool to ESNet first to get feedback, and then we'll hopefully release it to the rest of the community. Thank you. Thanks, Miriam. Okay, next, uh, Annette will tell us about the data dashboard work. Hi, yeah, so the data dashboard is integrated into the MyNERSC user interface. And um, in the beginning of 2020, what we had were, what was one tab called the data dashboard and that offers features for people to go in and see how they're doing versus a quota in terms of their data storage and the number of inodes they're using. Um, we also gave them a tool for browsing through their directories and seeing uh, the metadata for all the files in each directory and being able to kind of get a sense for what's where. Uh, and then we also introduced uh, a tool that allowed them to identify their largest files and directories and those with the most inodes in order to find what they might want to archive off and free up more space in their quota. So. The, at the end of, 20, uh, of 2019, what we had was basically um, tools for reporting back to the user, not so much in uh, enabling them to actually make changes in the system. So what we've implemented in 2020 uh, was uh, this tool called the PI Toolbox. And this is a way for PIs to be able to go in and actually fix things that may be blocking them um, in terms of you know, things that they might otherwise have to go to a consultant for to file a ticket in ServiceNow. Um, and what we're enabling them to do initially is to go in and, and set the permissions on files or change the groups of the, the, the group that owns it. Um, and they, they can basically go in and make changes regardless of who actually owns the file. So in a way they're doing what would normally be the impossible even at the command line. Um, but since they're a PI, we authenticate them and we allow them to make changes to uh, files within their own project directories. Um, we also give them a one-click option that's super easy if they want to uh, just make all of the files and directories within their project directory have the, the, all the same group and all group readable permissions. Um, super quick, just one click and then it runs in the background. Um, and we're moving towards setting it up so that they can also do uh, a change of ownership on a file. Um, and that will be uh, just a separate, um, another button that we'll just add into that, that interface. Um, and that we, all this stuff we were able to present at the SC20 state of the practice track. Um, and now we are working on developing uh, what will probably be yet another tab in my nurse that will allow people to do things like file transfers. And we're calling this a petabyte data portal. So that's basically the state of the dashboard. Great, thanks Annette. Uh, so now uh, Quincy and Serena are gonna tell us about work being done uh, around HDF5. That's great. 
Uh, so over the last year, we spent a fair amount of effort uh, improving the uh, support for experimental and observational data in HDF5. Um, beginning with this work uh, in collaboration with the LCLS team at SLAC, um, we've worked hard to improve the support for the XTC2 files that LCLS um, instruments and data uh, facilities produce, but those aren't very widely supported by the analysis tools that are currently um, out in the ecosystem. On the other hand, HDF5's ecosystem is quite large, but doesn't access XTC2 data. So in order to kind of meld those two together, we uh, devised a prototype vol connector, a plugin for HDF5 that allows HDF5 applications to directly read XTC2 files and um, support the most common XTC uh, objects in those files, as well as the most common HDF5 uh, API routines. So we can enable MATLAB to read XTC2 directly through its HDF5 interface and any other tools that are built around HDF5. So next steps over the next course of the project, whatever that looks like, uh, for this would be to enhance the, the support for XTC2 objects and broaden the number of HDF5 API routines that are supported and then, you know, do the usual uh, improved performance and kind of uh, optimize things for tool chain uh, efficiency, I guess. So next, we focused on uh, enhancing HDF5's support for streaming data. It's, it's a common you know, experimental uh, use case and uh, just not very well supported in HDF5. And likewise for variable size data, many records come out of cameras or other sorts of instruments that are not nice multi-dimensional arrays. And that's uh, been a weakness for HDF5. So over the past year, we've enhanced HDF5 to support stream data very directly, just improvements uh, to the basic parts of HDF5, the infrastructure that everyone uses. Uh, so two to 10x performance improvements are already baked into the um, library for the next release. We've written up and done some prototyping around uh, a, a more optimized API interface for HDF5 that really focuses at the data streaming use cases. And if we can implement that and move towards it, we would probably, uh, based on the current prototyping, expect another three to five uh, times performance benefit. And likewise, um, designed out the changes needed to support really efficient variable length data storage and access in HDF5 files. And we'd really like to play both of those pieces out over the next uh, section of the, of the project, you know, and improve and, um, productize the streaming API as well as the variable length data storage so that we can really raise all the boats uh, by in improving some of the storage infrastructure that HDF5 provides for everyone. And lastly, we've spent some time working on the uh, querying the metadata in HDF5 files so that um, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of metadata that's already built in and baked into self-describing formats like HDF5. And so I wanted to bring that out with this metadata indexing and querying mix project in order to allow applications to really extract the science data and enhance the ability to um, deliver science discoveries by you know, looking at the data that they've already got. They've already produced this data. They just want to explore it for better um, knowledge out of it. So next steps on that are to kind of explore the semantic relationships, you know, not just standalone pieces within the file, but the relationships between those guys and be able to um, query and build uh, more science uh, discoveries out of the relationships between objects, not just kind of across individual objects. Okay. Great. Thanks, Quincy. All right, and our last uh, technical work area update uh, is from Chris. Uh, tell us about work being done in advanced scheduling. G'day. Um, so where were we with advanced scheduling in, in January 2020? So uh, we had NRE, which is non-recurring engineering, with SCEDMD, who maintains SLURM, um, because we have a, an issue where we want to be able to accommodate experimental workflows um, without 
causing disruption to the existing workloads. Um, now we're going to use reservations for this, and there is an issue in scheduling where if you have reservations in place, they can cause a what's called a, a shadow on the on the workload. So the idea was we would have something which would allow a reservation to say, I will allow other people to use these nodes as long as they agree that they will be preempted within a certain amount of time as my experimental workload arrives. Um, so that's now in Slurm 2002. Um, we have um, done testing with that um, to check that the, it works. The issue we have is integrating it with um, how we charge for the use to the systems. And um, there's also a test configuration on Gertie, which is the, the test system, the Cori for the nurse staff um, for people to experiment with. Um, Coming in 2011, which we have, um, this was released in, in November, the end of November, and is currently on the test systems for Perlmutter. Um, we have scrontab, and the idea here is crontab workflows, they often tie people to particular login nodes. That means that should that login node get a hardware failure, then those um, tasks won't run. And we need things that are resilient in the face of that. Um, and the plan here is that essentially the SCEDMD folks have implemented uh, scontab, which is a command that looks very much like the crontab command and allows you to specify jobs to run at certain times. It has another nice effect, which is you don't have the case if you, you say um, have something running every hour and your task for some reason takes an hour and 10 minutes, then you end up with two running at the same time. Um, with this, it will only start the, the next one when the previous one is finished. Um, and it's, it's also a requirement for Perlmutter for this work. And that's it, thank you. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, all right, so um, we've really done a lot of work in the last year and we're already you know, thinking very carefully about what we're planning um, to do in the, in the next 12 months, um, in the last year of the project. Our main focuses um, are really around getting uh, the science teams up and running on Perlmutter um, and being able to demonstrate that uh, they can run an automated pipeline, whether that's on Cori or Perlmutter. Um, so running their analysis without human intervention. Um, and then we're also thinking very carefully about a sustainable support plan for this. Um, how do we transition the tools uh, to being able to handle long-term support, ensure that they're production hardened, um, that's another area we're working on this year. And really what all the work we're doing here within the Super Facility Project is pretty groundbreaking. Um, and we are making sure by doing this work, we're ensuring that we're well placed uh, to take advantage of the future directions uh, for OSCAR infrastructure. These are discussions that are going on uh, within the pro between the program managers and between um, uh, people in OSCAR. We uh, are very well placed to take advantage of um, or, and to lead in the area of, of um, developing components of a framework for geographically distributed workloads. And I think that's something that's gonna be very exciting for the future. So I just finished uh, by saying many thanks to the Super Facility team. This has been a very challenging year and they've been doing fantastic work. And I think you'll agree, uh, they've been doing a lot of uh, really impressive work in this past year. So thanks to everyone.